Does everybody know what I mean by uh, taking a cube of material? So, taking a cube. Yeah, I'm taking about a square worth of the width of this material. So, this is about three quarters or so. So, I'm taking about a three quarter cube or a square of material. So that's my first step is just literally just a simple puller on both sides just to get me that neck. And all that does is all that does is separate this area out so that then I'm going to start, now I'm going to grab that. Now I'm going to start drawing this out. And I can do this here. I can booger this up with a bunch of fuller marks just to pinch that down a little bit. I can do it on the edge of the anvil. I can come here to the horn and draw it out. Usually at home, I've got a couple of drawing dies and a power hammer and I'll stick it in the tire hammer for about three seconds and it goes whoop and papers it out and then I clean it up on the anvil. Whoop. Makes that sound too. It goes whoop. Um, the so. welder and you've got the torch back there and I said, Yes, sir. We do this in the spirit of the traditional blacksmiths. Right. Luckily, he asked me, what does that mean? I said, if they had them, they used them. <laughs> exactly. Right. So I, I have done the hand forged stuff, you know, and I appreciate it. But I don't do it very much, and so I'm not very good at it. I've gotten, I, I feel like I've gotten pretty good at using modern forging equipment to replicate hand forging techniques, you know, make, make the item look like it was hand forged, but it might have been forged on a hydraulic press or a power hammer or whatever. There's nothing wrong in my opinion with either way just whatever you want to do. No, that's just. And I really get a kick out of using high-tech stuff like 3D printers and induction forges to do something that's really, really old. You know. That's one of the reasons they make chocolate and vanilla. You know. <laughs> Induction forges are not a brand new technology, though. No, they are not. Back before World War II, they were used in, in tanks and stuff to, to harden stuff that couldn't be done without this regular forge. So when I the first guy that started uh, importing those things. It was Grant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he, he imported them for years. And then when he passed away, somebody else bought that company that he had started selling induction forges and they did it for a while and then they and then they quit. Well they were buying the same Chinese machines, kind of testing them and setting them up with the water hoses and all, and then selling them. But I, I don't know what happened to it after that. I don't know who, if anybody still owns that shop anymore or that business. That's two years ago. Yeah, at least. We well, have was a pretty good guy to talk to. I wish I wish I'd have gotten to meet him. But when I uh, so you can see where we're going, we're just tapering this out. Pretty simple taper. I've noticed that this, <clears throat> and I don't know, maybe it's the way I'm holding, but every time I do this by hand and I'm working here, this this tapered bar wants to twist and go rhombus on me. So I just knock the corners back down and bring it back to square that way. But it, it definitely wants to kind of go crooked. It's probably the person holding the hammer. Trying to get in out of there. Trying to get in out of there. 
If you're left-handed, it goes the other way. Yeah, that's right. That's true. You know. Jim, where's Palmer at? I'm trying to see Oklahoma. There's a oh, class right there. He's pitching the class, so he's making the same class. Uh oh. It's still a little over a quarter inch thick, so I'm going to bring that down, bring the thickness down. And when I bring that thickness down, it'll draw it out a little bit more. Um, then I'm going to take a cross bean and spread that cube that we left on the end. I'm going to spread that out. And it's going to become this wide handle area, or not handle. What do you call this? I don't know what you call this. Attachment. The attachment point. skills would be done by now. But um, I'm taking my time. We got all day. Trying to make sure I don't crack it or mess it up. I think I only brought one up. I sell the uh, the copper ones for 60 bucks. It's really old raw iron. <laughs> Third roll. Third roll. You could just say. So does the uh, does that does that include? The well, Harriet Tubman was born was buried there, man. Yeah. See what I'm doing? Is that is that price included getting haunted by this rod? No, no, that's free. <laughs> but you know that brings up a good point. People buy story. You know, people will people buy story. I mean, I'm not the only person on the planet making copper and steel scoops. You know, but uh, if 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 you can find a way to inject some history in your piece somehow, it, it helps. You know, it gets something to talk about. When people at their house grab that scoop, they go. Oh, hey, you know, that handle there is made from material that came from a... The English Channel. Yeah, or yeah, exactly. <laughs> from ship yeah. anchor chains from yeah. the English Channel. So yeah. some of the material that I've gotten from Jim is repuddled rot that was originally ship anchor chains. Mm -hmm. And you better believe it. When I use that material, I tell people that. Because story... It was on your sword, too. Yeah, like exactly. Four, 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 exactly, five, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Story matters, you know. I can't black that good. <laughs> yeah, you can. I've seen you do it. <laughs> You're doing it right now. <laughs> All right, so that's about what I want. That's, I, I like it pretty thick because I like these things to feel pretty hefty in your hand. You know, but that's pretty simple. It's just a tape. It goes from the neck to the wide part. That's this is not complicated stuff. Looks nice. So nice there we go. Nice nice second. Second. Put the cube on the end, like this. Now we're going to go to something like this. This is exaggerated. We're going to widen this area out. And then this area right here, I'm going to cheat and use a belt sander. You could do that by hand. You could forge that by hand. 100%. File it too. You could file it. I brought a file. We might do that. I'm not. I'm not beating this to death. I'm really just letting the weight of this hammer. Do the work here. Now, I'm not going to hammer that too much more. So uh, this is, I know a perfect name. This is called the whale tail. That's what we're going for. Here. All right. You see, it pretty much looks like a whale tail. All right. So 
all I did was I just rain blows in a lengthwise direction to spread the material in those directions, which that's the exact purpose of a cross peen hammer. That's what this is designed to do. For those of you that forge, you'll know this, but those of you that don't forge, you won't. The back end of this hammer and the reason blacksmiths use so many different looking hammers is we want the metal to move in a particular direction. So this is a round ball on this hammer. If I hit a piece of clay with this round part, what direction is the material going to go? It's going to go all the way. It's going to go in every direction. It's like, think of a cow patty. If you take this and smack a cow patty, it's going 360 degrees. If you take a baseball bat and whack a cow patty, your friends to the right and left are going to get covered, but you're going to be good, right? So that's the same principle with the cross paint. If you come down, wherever that hits, the material's going to go this way and that way and not all directions. So that's why I switched to this hammer was that I wanted this material only to move this way and that way. I did not want it to go that way. If I'd have used the round hammer to do this, this would have bulged out at the top and it would have bulged out at the bottom instead of spreading wide. So there we got a really nice little whale on one side of that. I did there. You can flip it, but uh, I usually only hammer one side to kind of keep it tapered because when I go to fold it to match the bowl in a minute, when I go to bend it down, I'm going to I'm going to look and see and usually the tapered side is what I'm going to attach the copper to. I mean, usually the flat side is what I'm going to attach the copper to. The tapered side will be on the outside. It just looks nicer. Right. So. Had to wait a minute to see which side to hit. Yeah, I can just rub my finger on it. <laughs> all right, that's all I want to do. <clears throat> I could go wider, but I don't want to go any narrower because I'm going to take some of this material out when I go to the grinder. And so I want it wide enough so that I can grind in that radius and not lose too much width. So, same exact shape, it's just a little bit wider now. We're going to try that. If I need help, I'll get help. Like that help I saw you doing on the other day, texturing those little items. Yeah, man, that's good help. So I'll make these little keychains for Clinton. 
with the Clinton High School logo in it, he's been pretty interested in this stuff, and so I put him to work. Alright, so I'm just going to do it like this. That disc always slides to one side of the bowl or the other. Yeah, and so I'm just, you can see I'm moving, just, I'm moving this thing around all over the place. Every time I've used a switch block to do that, the, the disc would always move to one side. So I'm going into the smaller area. Now I'm going to have to start tilting it like like this. What I'm doing is I'm deepening this bowl by using the sides of this small swage. Ideally, I would have a swage form that's between these two sizes. But I'm using what I got. So would you do it with a hydraulic form? You just going straight in there one time, or you? I'm using the fly press, and I, what I do is my, I got my fly press set up with one of these, and I sit there with a no gloved hand, and the fly press ball comes down like this, and I tilt this bowl at 45 degrees, and I go bump, twist, bump, twist, bump, twist, just like that, and so. I'm, I'm twisting the bowl like this around the side of that ball into this smaller swage. We're getting there. We're close. But you can see, you can see this one over here is a little deeper, just a little bit deeper. So yeah, so I've, I've got a wire wheel and we'll wire wheel this up after I texture it and it'll shine it up again. Uh, tool that's hot. That's generally what happens when things come out of the fire. There, that's very warm. What I'm doing is I'm just looking at the bowl, and if I see an edge that's bulging out, I'm moving it and trying to fix that bowl by hitting the other side of it. But this doesn't have to be perfect, but I want it to look fairly round. But if it's got a little, it's got a little bit of wonkiness in it, that's okay. It just shows that it was a handmade product. All right. So I am pretty satisfied with that, I think. There we go. You can put this together and send it off, but I want to texture this. The texture looks a lot better to me, so I'm going to get it a little bit warm. And then the tool that I was using the ball swage, I'm going to put this in the anvil now as a hardy tool, like that. And now I'm going to use, I'm going to use a ball peen hammer to do the texturing. Remember a while ago we were talking about peens and different shapes on the back of the hammers? Well, I'm going to use a ball to make a ball shaped dent. To make it look pretty. I'm going to put it on the swage and then just beat it. <laughs> I'm just moving it around, getting equal texture all the way around. I'm not hitting super hard because I don't really want to thin this bowl out a lot. 
I'm really just wanting to texture one side of it. I don't want to. This copper works so easy that if I really got after it, it would start thinning it out. I'm already seeing some of the texture on the inside. But just making little divots all the way around. How you how you that was, did after you had the eye. Same thickness you say? It yeah, same thickness, yeah. It's like 303 stainless or something, I think. Alright, so there's the bowl textured. One thing I didn't do was I like to hammer a little flat area around the lip. So this puts facets all around the edge. And this also kind of brings that circular shape back into shape. up a little bit too much. I couldn't get it. <clears throat> well, that's close. Yeah, that's got the curve that I'm looking for. If it fits your bowl, if it fits the copper. <laughs> Just enough of a curve to kind of, kind of match the bowl. I think, I think all that's doing for me there is really helping me to get my holes more accurately placed because putting that curve in there puts the holes a little closer than if I laid it on there flat and dotted the holes. And I'm placing the neck, that neck down area that we made earlier, I'm placing that right on the edge of the bowl. I'm going to just hold this together and I'm eyeballing it and I'm making sure that the bowl is level and it's not like this. You know, it's not kicked off to one side or the other. And I'm just I'm just eyeballing it, making sure it's good where I like it. And I dotted with the marker two little holes, the two spots where I'm going to make my hole. So I'm holding it on the swage just enough. Just enough for me to center punch it. Thank you. I get a dot on there and then I'll go to the other side. Alright. So those are pretty
got the rivet punch through. Got our handle. Now I'm going to take the handle and stick it over the rivets. But to do that, I have to push the rivets back out just a little bit because if I push them all the way through, they're kind of like this. So I'll pull it back in just a little bit. Kind of hold it with my thumb, lay the handle on the top, and if I'm lucky, they'll punch through like this. So this is what I want. Something like that. That's just where you can see just the flat part of where the shank of the rivet sticking out. And there's where we're at. And you can see the weird angle. We're making like a soup ladle right here, but we're going to fix that in a minute. All right, so now I'm going to lay it back on this ball swage and look for the tool I had in my hand just five seconds ago. Yeah. Ball peen hammer. So now that makes me wonder if that company Luak Coffee will give a nice container to your copper scoop. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is just set this rivet with the ball end on one side. I'm I'm hitting straight down on that rivet. And what that's doing with the ball end of this thing is it's it's compacting the rivet and making the rivet swell up in these holes and it's concaving or, or crushing the top of the rivet down in a concave fashion and starting to spread the top out just a little bit. So now that I got one side kind of locked in, I'm going to do the other side. like that and then I'm going to go back to the other side I don't rush this part all right so now I've got a little gap I got a little gap between the ball and the handle and that's just because that curve wasn't perfect so I'm going to hammer that down now I'm going to get after the rivets a little bit more aggressively and work around the edges of them and start spreading them out. That is that has pulled my handle up really nice to the ball. <clears throat> so I'm going to switch to a tiny ball peen, little teeny tiny ball peen, and I'm going to go on the outside of the ball swage. I'm cupping this in my hand like so. I'm just holding it so that I'm the, the bottom of the rivet is on the top of this. Now I'm going to hit the inside of that rivet, the flathead part. And really all I'm doing here is I'm texturing the, the rivet on the inside because the top has got that file texture to it. I don't want to leave that. I want to kind of give it something that looks a little nicer. So I'm just texturing that just a little bit. And this is further spreading those rivets in the holes and further strengthening this joint just a little bit. Thank you. 
soon as I get to a dull red, I'm gonna be good to go. I'm that out so fast. That Probably so. I see a little heat. I'm gonna go ahead and try it. I'm just gonna try it and see. Yeah, you know what? Let me get it set first. Yeah. Let me set it first and then we'll do it. I have been it cold before. Just for the little bit of time it's used on the scoop for the coffee, I don't think it's going to yeah. make a difference. Yeah. It's just not in contact just, with the I, I just Googled it. Yeah, it's a, it's a myth, but it's a myth. That's pretty common. How long does it take you in your shop, actually? I can make one in the shop in about 30 minutes. Yeah. That's a, a nice Mississippi logo you got there. Thank right? you. <laughs> yeah, it's one of a kind. That's the only one that's ever gets me. The Mississippi stamp. Eric, that is a beautiful Mississippi stamp. <laughs> I just want you to know, I love it. Appreciate it. I wanted somebody to acknowledge my Mississippi stamp. Hey, it's not Alabama. We will not be making Alabama scoops. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 I don't know if there's any 3D printed anvils left, but if you didn't get one, they're over in the back. And some stickers left. Um, anybody got any questions about the coffee?